living in the future kind of sucks. With how convenient everything is, it kind of feels like I almost want to go back to just the near past where everything was clunky, slow, more difficult to use, less streamlined. You know, do you ever get that feeling? No, it's just me. So I developed a time machine and um, I put it into my Google Assistant and basically what it does is it'll take objects, specifically technology, uh, from the past uh, that I request based on a prompt. Because, you know, I know the feeling, but I don't know exactly what it is that I want. So, uh, let's test it out, why don't we? Okay, Google. I want to listen to music like it's 2005 again. Your wish is granted. <laughs> Oh, look at that. Gave me a, a complete inbox iPod shuffle. That's pretty neat. Let's check it out. Okay, look at that. Uh, it has the price tag on it for $15. Um, Google, did you did you just buy this from a thrift store? No. I promise I walked in from 2005. Ha ha ha. Just give it to me. Ha 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 ha. Ha. You promise you didn't. I promise. Okay. Okay. Well, anyways, let's uh, let's get this tag off. Kind of ruins the immersion, doesn't it? <laughs> So this is the iPod Shuffle. It was 2005, and Apple was slowly dominating the MP3 player market, even breaking far into the flash market with their thick but pocketable iPod Mini. So oh, cool, man! Yeah. yeah, he's got an iPod Mini. What color? Teal. Steve Jobs took to the Macworld stage to present just one more thing. A device based on the popular shuffle function that was a staple of the iPod line and, and was soon to become an industry standard. The iPod Shuffle. A cost-effective solution for those that just want to set their music to shuffle and kick back or start dancing, I guess. It used the most integrated system on a chip for flash devices of its time, the Sigmatel STMP5XX. Ah, back when Apple was more than just a facade of greatness. Walk out the door, you see someone that you know, and they ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. It had no display. No click wheel. Playlists and many other of the features were missing. It was just the listener alone with their music on this stick. This was a pretty groundbreaking device for its time. I mean with the advent of digital music, which had been really happening since 1985 with the compact disc, but CDs were rapidly and suddenly becoming obsolete as options to buy music from your computer were quickly cropping up in the mid-2000s. Bad time to introduce the mini-disc, I guess. Anyways, during this time, people were listening to music on PSPs. Yeah, PSPs. So this $150 device that is roughly the same size as this ordinary pack of gum wasn't so bad of an option for those who wanted to portableize everything. This was obviously way before music streaming and smartphones and you get the point. It was an interesting time filled with experimentation and refinement with product design. Fingerprint scanners on computers, pocket PCs, Windows Vista. Windows Vista? Crazy times. Crazy times indeed. But like a movie or a song or a video game from said era, it must be asked for this product. Does it in fact hold up in the current age? where I can stream the entire discography of the Beatles from across the room while doing something else? Well, yes and no. It really depends on what your use case is. This little device packs a 12 hour battery life and doesn't have a screen. Don't expect to be playing Brick Breaker or Tetris on this thing. It also can't play Apple Lossless or AAC files. You'll have to downgrade to the average MP3. So this is a device that was top of its class for form factor MP3 players in its time, nearly 16 years ago now, without lossless playback or playlist management or any way to select specific albums, it seems like this is only fit for casual listening at best. The thing is, that makes this the perfect thing for study music. If you're tired of staring at screens and tend to default to printed materials for study like myself, 
this thing kind of helps for those long sessions where you can't just go and flip the record or change discs or flip the cassette. Hey, who's still, who's still studying with cassettes? Anyways, this is perfect for a good stream of music. I've managed to get about five hours of instrumentals on this device, and this variant is actually the smaller capacity of the two that were available in its only time. Only 512 megabytes. Now mind you, that was crazy back in the day, considering this is what flash media for cameras looked like at the time. That's not 32 gigs. That's, That's 32, 32 megs. But now if your device doesn't have at least 32 times the highest capacity a shuffle could have in 2005, then it is quickly considered useless. Still, this storage size is good enough for an audiobook or two. This thing is still smaller than most devices made for listening today, so it makes for the perfect thing if you're trying to listen to the My Immortal audiobook in bed. Coming soon. May maybe, but, but not really. You can't just promise things. You can't just promise things in a video that you definitely want them to do. Uh, okay, I'll, okay. Anyways, I'd say I could recommend this device to the people who still use paper to study in the INFORMATION AGE, and those who just happen to collect iPods. I've been enjoying this device quite a bit myself, and it makes a great addition to my collection. Uh, yeah. This is what it looks like um, on the inside. It doesn't have the dirty buds in there. Um, because, uh, I mean, who wants to use somebody else's used headphones? Not me. So that's fine. Uh -huh.